Hey, welcome back to Slow Bells. Today I'm in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Right now the East Coast in general and Fort Lauderdale in particular, we're all waiting for the latest summer hurricane to move by. Hopefully it goes by offshore without uh, creating too much of a disaster here. And it kind of looks like that's what's going to happen. It's been a long time since my last video, which was uh, released in December 2019. At that time, I envisioned spending the winter on a mooring ball at Marina Jacks in Sarasota, and then continuing on to the east coast of Florida around April 1st. But it didn't quite work out that way. On January 1st, 2020, I moved from Sarasota to a marina, Safe Harbor Regatta Point Marina in Palmetto, Florida, which is just south of Tampa a little ways, which was pretty cool. At the marina, if I wanted to go ashore, I just walked on the dock. In Sarasota, if I wanted to go ashore, I had to get in the dinghy and row to shore. So the marina was definitely an improvement on my life in general. And also, my friend Carol from Washington, D.C. came down to join me on the boat for a couple months. Unfortunately, by the time uh, April 1st, 2020 rolled around, the world was in the middle of the COVID-19 coronavirus international pandemic. And what a mess it was and is at this particular time. Uh, I didn't really feel comfortable traveling at that time, so I postponed my departure from Palmetto until July. The world was still messed up in July, but I figured I had waited about as long as I intended to wait. So on July 1st, 2020, Carol cast off the dock lines and she and I headed towards the east coast of Florida. This video will cover the portion of the Great Loop trip from the Tampa area to Fort Lauderdale through Lake Okoboji. Check it out. You have some navigational options when you travel by boat from the Tampa area to the Fort Lauderdale area. Let's break up this portion of the Great Loop into two segments. The first segment will be from the Tampa, Sarasota area to the Fort Myers area. And there are two ways to do this segment. The first way to get to Fort Myers would be to go out into the Gulf of Mexico. There's plenty of deep water out there, but it's not very scenic. I chose the other option, which is to follow the Intracoastal Waterway, which is a protected waterway that runs parallel to the Gulf of Mexico. I had no problems with the ICW in my trawler, which has a four-foot draft. But if you're traveling on a sailboat with a deep draft keel, you would need to watch the tides in a few spots. There are at least three ways that I know of to get from the Fort Myers area to Fort Lauderdale. The first is to go to Key West and then work your way northeast along the Atlantic coastline. The second way to get to Fort Lauderdale would be similar to the first option, but instead of going all the way to Key West, you would cut through the Florida Keys, maybe somewhere in the vicinity of Marathon, Florida. I think there might be a couple different options when it comes to where you can cut through the keys. The third way to get to Fort Lauderdale would be to cut right through the middle of Florida, passing through Lake Okeechobee in the process. This is the route that I took. Once again, my trawler had no problems with water depth, but a sailboat with a deep draft keel would need to be careful in places. And if the water level in Lake Okeechobee got low enough in a drought year, this route might even have some challenges for a trawler. When I passed through the lake in the summer of 2020, low water was not an issue. As a postscript to this discussion on route options, I would also like to add that there are two ways to get across Lake Okeechobee. The first option, which is known as Route 2, follows the lake's southeastern shoreline. The other option, which is officially known as Route 1, cuts directly across the lake. This was the route taken by Slow Bells. Both of these route options are marked by buoys out on Lake Okeechobee. 
I spent roughly a month on a mooring ball at Marina Jacks in Sarasota. My dinghy became my water taxi and I quickly learned that the wind was capable of blowing harder than I was capable of rowing. Most of the days were warm and sunny, but not all of the days. I enjoyed some great sunsets out there in the mooring field. And it turned out to be a great viewing location for the New Year's fireworks display. In New York City, they drop the ball at midnight. In Sarasota, they drop the pineapple at midnight. On January 1st, 2020, I left the mooring field and I returned to the Manatee River where Slow Bell settled into her new home in Regatta Point Marina in Palmetto. It turned out to be a great marina and it was the only marina I could find in the area that was a liveaboard friendly marina. Carol and I visited the Gulf of Mexico shorelines a few times in her car. Although I didn't have a car, I was able to walk to the grocery and hardware store and a city bus would take me to either West Marine or clear down to Sarasota if that's where I wanted to go. I did some boat projects over the winter. I refinished the aft hatch. I put some paint on my decks. I added an accumulator tank for my pressure water system. I installed a new battery charger and I installed a new meter that monitored the amperage being used in my 12 volt electrical system. I also noticed that my generator was not sending any voltage to my 115 volt electrical system, but thankfully that problem turned out to be a faulty switch, not the generator. Carol and I departed Regatta Point Marina on July 1st, 2020. After a short trip west, to the mouth of the Manatee River, we turned south on the intercoastal waterway, dodging a rain shower or two along the way. Carol was able to contact friends ashore by phone and they could see our boat in the distance. A rather strange long distance communication took place as they wa waved a flag from shore and Carol waved a towel from the boat. We passed through Sarasota and made it to Venice in the late afternoon. I thought Venice might be a good place to anchor for the night, but the anchorages looked pretty small and pretty shallow to me, so we kept on going. We eventually anchored near the town of Inglewood. It quickly became obvious that traveling along the coast of Florida in the summer was a whole different ball game from doing the trip in the winter. The heat and humidity was brutal during the day and it didn't magically disappear when the sun went down. I ended up sleeping on the upper deck that night in Inglewood where there was at least a little breeze. The only way to keep the main cabin cool at night was to run the air conditioner which for me meant running the generator through the night, something I preferred not to do. The engine room became a furnace during the day when we were underway. As a result, I kept the engine room blower running during the day and into the evening, something I had never done before. After that first night at anchor, we spent the rest of our nights in a marina where we could run the air conditioner all night using the marina's shore power. Carol got the anchor up the next morning at our Englewood anchorage and we headed out again. Our destination this day was to a marina at the little town of Burnt Store. This place appeared to me to be a series of condos out in the middle of nowhere built for the winter snowbird migration. The harbor has a right side and a left side. I can say with some authority that if you are headed for the marina and if you go around a curved waterway that looks like this, 
then you are headed over to the wrong side of the harbor. To get from Burnt Store to Fort Myers, I originally planned to pass east of Pine Island. However, I was warned of shallow water along that route, so Carol and I went back to the ICW for a longer but deeper water passage. There is a manatee no-wake zone along the way, and all of the go-fast boats are forced to slow down here. It is so painful for them to slow down that this section of the ICW has become known as the Miserable Mile. We stayed at Legacy Harbor Marina in Fort Myers, which was a short walk to the downtown Fort Myers area. It's about 120 miles across Florida from Fort Myers to Stewart. We took four days to do it, but you could do it in less time if you wanted. We encountered six locks along the way. Interestingly enough, both gates were wide open at two of the locks, so you could motor right through, no stop required. I think these two locks are only operated when the water level of Lake Okeechobee is unusually high or unusually low. For all of the locks, there were ropes hanging down from the lock walls that you hung on to while the lock water level was changing. The first day of our trip across Florida took us from Fort Myers to the town of LaBelle. We came across a fishing boat that was having engine problems in the morning, so we gave him a tow back to his boat ramp. Our passage through Franklin Lock was mostly uneventful except for the fact that I completely forgot to put out my fenders before entering the lock. The free city docks in LaBelle were much nicer than what I was expecting. They provided a free power hookup, but no restrooms or showers. The second day of our Florida crossing took us to Clewiston. One of those classic Florida afternoon thunderstorms caught up with us as we were approaching the lock at Ortona, so we just anchored for a while and enjoyed the show. The Ortona lock caught me a little off guard. The turbulence inside the lock was as bad as any lock I had been through on the Great Loop. The rope I was hanging on to almost got away from me, I just barely had enough rope remaining to put the rope on a cleat as the turbulent water tried to push my boat forward. The Clewiston lock later in the day was much easier for us and we pulled into Roland Martins Marina in Clewiston around dinner time. We crossed Lake Okeechobee on the third day of our Trans-Florida trip 
and went as far as the marina in Indian Town. I assumed that I needed to pay close attention to the buoys that mark the route number one, which is the direct route across the lake. But if the charts are to believed, there appears to be 10 to 15 feet of depth over a wide portion of the lake. Hopefully someone much more familiar with Lake Okeechobee can comment on whether or not it's really important to follow those buoys across the lake so carefully. This is the lock at Clewiston. The gates at both ends of the lock were wide open. No need to stop here. As you can see, we are pretty far from shore, but the water is still only 10 feet deep in the summer of 2020. Here again at Port Mayaka, the doors on both ends of the lock were wide open. We spent the night at the Indian Town Marina. This is really more of a boatyard than a marina, but it worked just fine for us. I assume these straps are necessary in the event of a hurricane. In the evening, Carol was able, able to grab a quick picture of a passing alligator. We watched one catch and chew up a big fish then swallow the whole thing. Very impressive. On the final day of our cruise across Florida, we headed towards the city of Stewart, Florida. The lock at St. Lucie was a very special lock for me it would be the last lock of my Great Loop trip. While locking through, Carol saw a manatee inside the lock chamber. The lock master said the manatee seemed to like it in there because he was often sighted locking through. That night, we stayed at Pirates Cove Resort and Marina. From Stewart, it was just a matter of pointing the boat south on the Intracoastal Waterway. And for the first time in a very long time, the red buoys were finally on the right side of the boat. We stopped for the night at Safe Harbor Newport Cove Marina in Riviera Beach, which is just north of West Palm Beach. On the following day, we were able to make it into Fort Lauderdale. We didn't make very good time, but our slow progress was not the fall to slow bells. There are quite a few bridges along this stretch of the ICW. We were able to sneak under some of them, but we had to wait for the rest to open up for us. 
Also, there are several no-wake zones due both to uh, marinas along the way and manatee habitats. It was around dinner time when we finally reached Las Olas Marina, our home for the next few days. I knew I would be in Fort Lauderdale for at least a month. Carol and I did some scouting around and we decided to relocate to Cooley's Landing Marina, which is only a few miles up the New River from the Las Olas Marina. This turned out to be a a pretty interesting, although short, trip. The new river is fairly small as it twists and turns through Fort Lauderdale. Downtown buildings rise up on either side of the river. While we're waiting for this train, let me tell you something that is kind of interesting about the new river in Fort Lauderdale. As I said before, the river is fairly narrow with a lot of twists and turns. The current can run either upstream or downstream depending on what the tide is doing. And there are several drawbridges along the river. There are also some very large yachts that are kept on this river. I know at least some of them are kept at Marina Bay Marina, and there may be other super yacht marinas as well. So the question might fairly be asked, how do you get those big ass super yachts safely up and down such a narrow winding river with all that river current? Well, this is how you do it. I was surprised that there were so many of these big yachts being towed up and down the river. For me, this is the end of the road and the last video for my Great Loop Trip series. Unfortunately, Slow Bells never got to do the portion of the Great Loop between uh, Brunswick, Georgia and Stewart, Florida. Uh, I was fortunate in that I was able to do this portion of the trip and a lot more of it years ago when I was crewing on a Grand Banks 36. Now that we're in uh, Fort Lauderdale, my plan is to put Slow Bells on the deck of a cargo ship and have her sent out to her new home in uh, Washington State in the North Puget Sound area. Once the boat is put on a ship I'll be driving out there in my car and waiting for my boat to show up. 
I used to live in Seattle several years ago, and I've always wanted to return there. Now that I'm retired, that's exactly what I intend to do, although my new home will be about 100 miles north of Seattle. I certainly envision doing more of these YouTube videos over time, but future videos are going to be some kind of a jumbled up mix of canoeing and kayaking and local trawler trips. I also hope to publish a book about my Great Loop trip called Slow Bells on the Great Loop. This book will be published uh, in Amazon Kindle format and I think it'll be available for purchase by uh, Christmas 2020. Thanks for traveling along with me on my Great Loop trip. The trip had some challenges along the way, but overall I thought it was a pretty good trip and I'm glad I was able to do it. I hope some of you are able to do it in your own boat someday. Have fun. Be safe. Later.